the record for case, why did I put this back on? Case number uh, CR 2017-06-1953, State of Ohio versus Stanley Ford. Mr. Ford's present, represented by counsel, Mr. Uh, Riley, Mr. Gorman and Mr. Riley. Um, on behalf of the state, our attorneys Leprinzi and D'Angelo. <clears throat> we are um, in, it is Thursday, September 9th. Um, it is 9 a.m. The jurors are in the jury room. Um, we, at this time, I'm going to again reiterate the procedures that the court is taking um, with regards to the current state of mask mandates and administrative orders issued by both the Summit County Executive and the Summit County Common Pleas Administrative Judge. Um, first of all, all jurors, uh, the first 12 jurors are seated in the jury box. They are all um, wearing masks at all times. They are separated with plexiglass between them as well as plexiglass in the front of the jury box. The court has submitted, um, I think, Courts Exhibit 3 um, as a picture of what the courtroom looks like um, with regards to the jury box. Counsel and those participating are wearing masks at all times and unless until they are speaking. Uh, when witnesses enter the courtroom, they are wearing a mask. Once they're seated and sworn, they remove their masks, and no, no witness will testify um, with a mask on. And again, these procedures were discussed prior to us um, starting this trial. In addition, in between witnesses, um, we have a uh, person who is disinfecting the area as well as changing the microphone cover. Um, Mr. Luprinzi, is that um, your... Uh, I guess, do you agree with those statements that the court has made regarding the procedures that we've implemented? We do. Mr. Gorman? Yes, Your Honor, that's all correct. All right, and again, Mr. Um, Ford, um, because you are the accused, you have a right not to wear a mask. Um, if you don't want to wear a mask, you don't have to. If you prefer to wear a face shield, you, will do the, you could do that. Or if you choose to wear the white cloth mask that you're currently wearing, you're permitted to do that. Do you understand those rights? I do, Your Honor. And you choose to continue to wear your white cloth mask. I do, Your Honor. Thank you. I also find that um, the orders uh, that have been um, issued by the executive as well as the administrative judge do not um, supersede Mr. Ford's right um, his constitutional rights to confront his accusers um, to a fair trial and um, due process. And therefore, I believe I am in compliance with those mandates, but with the, those exceptions to allow Mr. Ford to have his day in court and have a fair trial. Mr. Riley. Your Honor, good morning, Mayor. Please support Scott Riley. Joe Gorman on behalf of Stanley Ford at this time. Again, we renew all prior motions. Uh, we've made in this matter, including but not limited to the motion for severance in our opposition to the joiner in this matter. Specifically, as it relates to today's testimony, we object to any testimony regarding the incident that occurred on January 23rd, 2017, uh, on Russell Street and uh, Nigel Sam's vehicle and the fire associated with that being tried all together. Alrighty, your uh, motions are uh, acknowledged but overruled based on my previous written decisions. Mr. Just very quickly, yesterday uh, we had played uh, Stacey's at a 104A, which was the defendant's statement made on July 6, uh, 2016. Uh, I marked it as 104A because statement 104, um, uh, or evidence rule 104, I'm going to submit to the court not to go back to the jury. This is the unredacted portion of, of the statement on July 6, 2016. For the record, I did redact the following sections. 0, 0, 0046 seconds to one second and two seconds, uh, where he references a polygraph. A polygraph is referenced. Um, uh, five minutes, two seconds to five minutes, 37 seconds, where a polygraph is referenced or discussed. Uh, six minutes, 23 seconds to seven minutes, 22 seconds, where a polygraph and request for counsel, or a, a discussion of counsel, is uh, discussed. 8 minutes 37 seconds and 8 minutes 48 seconds where the polygraph is discussed. 8 minutes 59 seconds through 10 minutes and 9 seconds where polygraph is discussed. 10 minutes and 59 seconds through 11 minutes and 44 seconds where um, reference to an attorney is made. 14 minutes and 20 seconds through 15 minutes and 54 seconds where reference to a polygraph is made. 16 minutes. 38 seconds through 17 minutes and 4 seconds where reference to a polygraph is made. Finally, 17 minutes 
41 seconds through 17 minutes and 54 seconds where uh, reference to an attorney. So those are the sections that I redacted and then played um, in State's Exhibit 104A. 104 I will give to the court reporter uh, to go with the court's exhibits and for it not to go back to the okay. So then we, um, I know that yesterday we had a uh, discussion at sidebar regarding those redactions and I believe that uh, the defense had agreed that um, those were statements that um, they did not believe the jury should hear. Mr. Gorman? That's true, Judge. Okay. Anything else for the record? Just one last thing before I forget. Um, I'm thinking about it and keep forgetting about it. And not for now, but when I speak it so we all know. We had talked about this previously, I think, in the last trial and maybe even in the team. At some point in time, we would ask the court to instruct the jury and we would have to come up with something to say regarding the fact that Mr. Ford, if they see him walking in the hallway, that they should not use how he is walking today with how he may have been walking back at the time of this incident. The reason we bring that up is because Mr. Ford, number one, is wearing a leg brace because of the uh, sheriff's um, requirements, safety and uh, uh, requirements, and so that affects how he's walking. I know that I've seen him in the hallway, and there are times when he's been out there with his hands covered so they don't know that he's in custody, but he's walking in a German walk. So we want to make sure that if they see him walking the courtroom around the hallway, that they don't see him with his big limp because of this brace on his leg, and then associate that with the video. Judge, if we ever talked about this before, I just don't have a recollection of it. I'd ask the court to give myself and Mr. Riley some point to convert and we can respond appropriately. Uh, I'm going to ask them to submit some proposed language right. and then we'll have a conversation on it. But I am making notes about like things that we still need to talk about or that we'll need to talk about in the future. Thank okay? you. Sure. So this is my don't forget list right there. All right. Anything else? All right. So um, we'll bring the jury in. Tanisha, I think, is right outside. Sure, because they're going to come in the other way. All rise, please. The Southern County Court of Common Police is now in session. The Honorable Christian Kirsch is presiding. Thank you. You may be seated. Welcome, everyone. So by a show of hands, um, I will again ask, as I do every morning, um, that whether you have complied uh, with my previous admonitions and not spoken to anybody about this case, nor read or seen anything. By a show of hands, please. All right, all, eight, all 17 have said yes. So um, we are recalling Detective Stewart to resume her testimony. But she's, I think, ran to the restroom. Yes, No. So, David, this is a continuation of no from yesterday, okay? All right. You, you maybe see, yeah, well, I might as well do it again. All right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Okay, go ahead and be seated. And then I'll just remind you or ask you that you complied with my admonition yesterday and did not speak with anybody about your testimony? Yes. Okay. All right, Mr. Gorman, you may proceed. My name is Joe Gorman. My co-counsel is Scott Riley, and together we represent Stanley Ford. Uh, I'm going to have a series of questions for you this morning. What I'm going to ask you to do is to listen closely to them, my questions. Sometimes they're hard to understand, and I appreciate that. Make sure you understand, or you believe you understand the question before you answer. Is that fair? That's fair. And if I, if I ask a question that you don't understand, just please tell me, hey, I don't understand what you're asking. I'm a little confused. And I'll try and sort it out for you. Is that also fair? That's fair. All right. If I gathered correctly, you were a detective or you were a police officer for 25 years upon your retirement in 2019. Correct? Yes. And in 2000 and approximately 2000, 2001, did you become a detective then? I couldn't tell you the year. Okay. How long were you a detective? Was it eight years or so? Yeah, I would put it. 
from a grandmother, so I put it <laughs> near the birth of my grandchildren. <laughs> so um, I would say in 2013, okay, four, somewhere in there. So, but when this case was had begun in April of 2016, you had been a detective at that point for about three years. Is that fair? We'll guesstimate, yes. Okay, I, I'm not going to hold you to the exact number. I'm just trying to get. Hey, man. Yes. Okay. All right. If I need an exact number from you, I'll, I'll tell we'll you. We'll just refer to record. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, you said you under you had undergone, obviously, police academy school yes. pr prior to becoming an officer. And then as you're an officer over the years, you would tell this jury, I believe, that there is on-the-job training uh, that's continuing, correct? Correct. And then there was also training that you received to become a detective, correct? Not to become a detective but to hone skills as a detective. Okay, to hone, well, explain the difference to me. Um, we're civil service commission, so it's a bid position. Okay. So with seniority, you bid, you, you get the position, and then you train. Okay, but you you received training. They didn't just, okay, you're, it, you, you win the bid, all of a sudden you're a detective, we give you no training. They gave you training when, they, when you won the bid. You get advanced training, yes. Okay, and you took that training, correct? Correct. All right. Um, as a patrol officer, you would you would um, file more what we call incident reports or action takens, correct? Not necessarily action takens, but file more incident reports. Okay. Well, tell us the difference between an incident report then and a report of investigation. An incident report is any it's for the primary investigation. Um, so sometimes you'll take a, a criminal report. Um, a crash report and there's no secondary investigation required okay. so those preliminary um, reports that initiate any type of investigation is patrol okay and that's an incident report and it would be more of a cursory or a brief report correct? yes all right and then what's an action taken just what it says what would a summary of, of actions you may have taken related to the case okay for instance in this case there's a lot of action taken so there are things like a patrol officer is on scene and they do a canvas of the neighborhood and they create an action taken, correct? That's an example, yes. Okay, that's an example. I appreciate it. Um, and then a report of investigation is more of the complete investigation, the ongoing investigation, and it's usually prepared by the lead detective in the case. Would you agree? Agree. All right. And in this case, you did a report of investigation as the lead detective in the 2016 719 Fultz uh, house fire, correct? Correct. All right. And that report of investigation is 60 pages in length, correct? I'll take your word for it. All right. Did you review your report of investigation in preparation for your testimony today? Yes. Okay. Do you have a copy of it with you? I do. All right. Here's what I'm going to say to you. At any point in time, if I ask you any question, and you want clarification because you just said, I'll take my word for it, right? I want you to take my word, mm. all right, because it was your investigation. Mm. If you need to refer to your report to get the answer, if you just kindly tell us, I want to refer to my report to get that answer, I don't have any issue with that, okay? Just let us know you're doing it. Fair enough? All right. Fair you enough. have it with you on the stand right now? I have it down here, my All first. right, you can pull it up and put it up. Uh, you know, you can oh, I'll, I'll pull it as needed. All right, all right. You're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Let me get ready. Well, 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 let me say, because, right, when you do a report of investigation, you're trying to be fair both to the state of Ohio in your report and to the defense, right? What I'm trying to do is uh, write a summary of things that will recall um, some of the most pertinent information to mind when it comes to testimony. Sure. Well, you would want to be fair to both parties, correct? Absolutely. All right. And... The report of investigation is designed for you to put all of the pertinent, pertinent, important information about what you did in your investigation into that report. Is that fair? It's impossible to put all. I said but, the most. But, but, but you try. You do try. I said the most important, pertinent information you're trained to put in your report. Are you not? You do try. Yes. Okay. Well, I know you're human and you make mistakes, but you just like the rest of us, but. You're supposed to try and put all the important information about who you talk to, when you talk to them, what you did in the course of your investigation into that report. Isn't that fair? Yes, that's fair. Okay. Because sometimes, like in this instance, it's been almost five and a half years since 
you investigated, you at least began investigating this case, correct? Correct. And you stopped being a detective in 2019, correct? Correct. In between 2016 and April when you started this investigation and 2019 when you retired, there were probably many, many, many cases that you worked on, correct? Correct. And you certainly don't want to re confuse the information for other from other cases with this case when you're sitting on that witness stand under oath, do you? God forbid. No, it, it, and, and, and to try and protect from that, you do things that a detective should do, and you review your report of investigation, correct? Correct. You, in fact, I'm sure met with the prosecutors in preparation for your testimony as well, correct? We had a Zoom meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. but you met with them. Yes. Okay, whether it was in person or by video, you met with them. Amen. Right? And you talked to them about what kinds of questions they would ask when you took the witness stand, correct? No, what do you mean? All right, well, they, you talked to them about what you would testify to. No? How specific are you speaking? Well, it, it, in, in terms of what you did in your investigation, you went through your investigation with them when you prepared. Yes, if you're talking about probable cause, why someone's a suspect, why someone's a witness, um, and just to review what I, you know, the notes and stuff that I had, yes. Exactly, and that's nothing nefarious. That's something that all police <laughs> officers do in preparation mm. for their testimony, right? It should be. It should be, and you mm. did that in this case. Yes. Okay. You said yesterday, I think you said six and a half years, but you said yesterday, wow, that's been six and a half years ago. I'd have to refer to my report. Do you remember saying that yesterday? Yes. All right, and that's the reason why the report of investigation is so important, correct? One of the reasons. Okay, because you want to get it right. You try to. Right. Well, when you're recording the things that you did close to the time you did them, that's probably more reliable than reflecting back without the report and telling us what you did five and a half years ago, is it not? Probably, yes. Okay. Could you verify for me now that your report of investigation is 60 pages in length, please? It is precisely 60. Exactly 60? That's, that's the last number of page I have. Okay. From 160. All right. Yesterday you were asked about 719 Fultz and the people that lived at 719 Fultz and you said they were basically some guys that hung out on a porch. I'm paraphrasing, but you said something like that to the jury. Do you remember that? That's a light paraphrase, yes. Okay. You actually learned during the course of your investigation back then that there were more issues than that at 719 Fultz leading up to that fire, did you not? Yes. How far in advance? Well. Let's talk about those things. The fire is April 18th of 2016, early morning hours, agree? Yes. You are on scene at some point in the morning hours of April 18th, 2016, do you agree? Yes. You are there in an in interview, Thomas Ugly on the scene, do you not? I did. In the in the Akron Fire Department medic van, is that true? Yes. All right, and you said something yesterday, you said, and, and, and I asked you to clarify it, you said, that was the first time I talked to him. Is there another time you talked to Thomas Ugly other than in that fire van, in that van at the Akron medic? Yeah, throughout the course of that day, um, because he came down to the station, we had to get him some housing, where he's gonna stay and stuff like that. Okay. But as far as what he saw, what he experienced, and what he, what, what he knew about that fire, the, the, the interview that took place on April 18th inside that van was the only time you talked to him about the details of the fire. Is that fair? That's all I recall from him. Okay. And if you want to look at your report of investigation to see if there's any other place where you had noted that you had spoken to him about what happened during that fire, uh, please do. That was fine. Okay. So you agree with me? I'll agree with that. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to excuse my horrible writing <laughs> and maybe my spelling too, but I'm just trying to create in my old school archaic way a little bit of a timeline, okay? Okay. Have 
I misspell Mr. Hubley's name, it's certainly not because uh, I'm trying to be disrespectful. Just know I can't see that. I know. I'm going to tell you what I'm writing. I'm actually writing it from the jury. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So if I said to you, you interviewed Thomas Hubley on April 18th, uh, of 2016, you would agree with that, right? I would agree. Okay. You learned during the course of your investigation that he wasn't the only person that lived in that that basement, correct? Correct. So at 719 Fultz, when you show up and, and you start your investigation, you learn that four people lived in that house in April of 2016. Is that fair? Three people lived, one visited frequently. Okay, and she had her own bedroom, correct? She had her own bedroom when she came. Right, and that would be Gloria Hart. Yes. Okay, and obviously Lindell Lewis, because he was the owner of the house. Yes. Okay, and you learned that Thomas Hughley, correct? Yes, and Ronald Garrett. And, and, and Ronald Garrett? Yes. Okay, also lived in that house, correct? In the basement. Okay, we had heard testimony from Thomas Hughley in this case that Ronald Garrett was actually at at um, two, 719 Fultz in the evening hours prior to the fire, but had left. Were you aware of that? I knew that he was there the day before, whether it was afternoon or evening, I don't know. Okay. Um, but he was there the day before and left to family and friends' house. He okay. didn't spend the night. All right. If Thomas Hughley tells us he looked across the street when he was cutting uh, Chester's lawn and saw him walking up the driveway, the the evening uh, of the fire. You don't dispute that. I don't dispute that. Okay. So, Ronald Garrett, you had to put out a be on the lookout for report for him, did you not? I did. Okay. And that was because you wanted to speak to him about his whereabouts during the fire, correct? Yes. And you considered him, at least initially, a suspect, fair? Yes, I did. Okay. You track him down or put out, the, what, tell, tell the, ladies and gentlemen of the jury what a be on the lookout for is, or a bolo they call it, right? A bolo is when we send out word through patrol, sometimes media, to, you know, we're looking for a person or a vehicle or something. So to be on the lookout. Okay. Mm -hmm. You are able to get in touch with Ronald Garrett on April 22nd. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, and you conduct an interview of him on April 22nd, correct? Yes. You're unable to locate him April 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st. Fair enough? Right. Okay, so if I wrote up on that board and I was just putting the date of the interview down for Ronald Garrett and I put Ronald Garrett dash April 22nd, that would be the day you were finally able to interview him. Fair? Yes. Okay. And once again, I may have spelled the name wrong, I apologize. You interviewed Gregory Lewis on May 3rd, 2016. Does that sound right? I concede. Pardon me? I will concede to that. Well, well you can look at it and make sure I'm right if you want to. It, it, it appears you look at it. I trust your Okay, your date. fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right. Who is Gregory Lewis? That is the brother of the deceased Lindell Lewis. Okay. And you had a discussion with him about um, his his knowledge of 719 Fultz, correct? Correct. And you learned during the course of your investigation that Gregory Lewis had actually lived at 719 Fultz about a year prior. Is that yeah. fair? Yes. And Gregory Lewis today is deceased, correct? To my knowledge, yes. Okay. He, he died about three months after this, this fire? Sounds correct. Okay. So if I put Gregory Lewis May 3rd, 2016 up there, that would be accurate as it relates to your report and your time that you interviewed him, correct? I'll go with yes. Well, I, I, don't, I don't want you to go with me. I, I'd ask, let me. Let me I, I, can, I, can, I can look, Yeah. but I, I believe you on the dates. That's, right. that's. Please, well, just please look while I'm checking, okay? okay? I, don't, I don't want it to be my testimony, I want it to be yours. I mean, yeah. Okay.
Gregory Lewis made their 2016 at around 0800 at his home. Okay. So around 12.08 a.m. at his home. Okay. You learned during the course of your investigation in these interviews that there was drug activity at 719 Fultz, correct? Yes. You learned there was issues with Thomas Ugly and Ronald Garrett and whether they were paying the drug dealers that they owed money to, did you not? Yes. You learned there were some confrontations there at 719 Fultz, did you not? Arguments, yes. Yes. Between Thomas Ugly and Ronald Garrett, perhaps, and the, and, the, and the people they owed money to for drugs, correct? Not necessarily between the two gentlemen, but there may have been some discrepancies of as to who one may have paid um, for their drugs or who didn't, and who may have been, you know, looking for them, wanting to do some, right? You know, beat them up for. There, there were drug dealers. There were drug dealers that were upset with those gentlemen for not paying for their drugs. That is what I heard. Yes. Okay. After you had your interview with Gregory Lewis. Did you ever go back and re-interview Thomas Hughley or Ronald Garrett about those confrontations with their drug dealers? No. Okay. Did you ever ask Thomas Hughley or Ronald Garrett who they bought their drugs from? Did not. Okay. If you did, and they told you I'm making up a name, John Smith or Mike Brown was my drug dealer, and they potentially lived in the neighborhood, or were anywhere else for that matter, you could have then followed up with John Brown and Mike Smith, or Mike Smith and John Brown, whatever I said, and you could have asked them <coughs> where they were the night of this fire, could you not have? I could have, but we both know the realism of someone giving the name of their drug dealer and or drug dealer saying where they were. Did you even try? I did not. What's an alibi, by the way? An alibi is your uh, recollection of, of your whereabouts at a said time and place. I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't hear you. I apologize. <laughs> I don't think I can say it the same. Let me go again. Uh, an alibi is one's explanation um, or given answer for their location at a said time and date. Okay, so in other words, if I'm the defendant or if I'm the suspect, I say to you, detective, I couldn't have committed this crime on April 18th of 2016 because I was at my sister's wedding in Kalamazoo, Michigan on that date. That's an alibi, right? That's an alibi, that's their alibi. That's their alibi and my alibi could either be strong or weak, correct? It could be strong, weak, truth, or a lie. Sure. In other words, if I have video date time stamp, date tamp, stamp timed of me at my sister's wedding in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I have 200 people who are willing to come in and say, he was there, and oh, by the way, here's his hotel receipt, I got a pretty strong alibi, don't I? That would be. Right. Detectives frequently talk to suspects and they ask them where they were during the crime, don't they? Yes. And then when detectives get that information from that person, they can look into and check the alibi, can they? We try. Right? Yes. You can see if it can be verified, yes. right? Yes. If, in other words, if I say, for instance, I'm at work while the fire is happening and I had to clock in, I can, as a detective, go and I can subpoena the hourly work records of that individual, and I can see whether they're telling me the truth or not, right? Right. So you can you can try and discount a, an alibi, or you can help actually, as the detective, help verify that person's telling the truth. Correct. Right? So we need to move on from that person, right? Yes. Okay. So when I go back and I talk about just some guys, or you had said yesterday, just some guys sitting on a porch. There's more to what's going on at 719 Fultz prior to that fire than just sitting on a porch, right? 
Those, uh, if you're talking about historically, not necessarily moments before, but historically, yes. Okay, yeah, not moments before, mm -hmm. but but there were there were nefarious things going on at 719 Fultz, illegal activity, correct? Some of the people that lived there engaged in some drug usage. Yes. In fact, we heard testimony from other witnesses in the neighborhood said that it was a wild bunch over there. That's what we've heard in this trial. Okay, I wouldn't say a wild bunch, okay. but, but, you know, they could be uh, boisterous um, according to another um, neighborhood person, yeah. Sure, and I'm not asking you to say what the neighborhood people said. They've already sat on that stand and told us. Amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you find Ronald Garrett and talk to him on the 22nd of um, April. May. Um, or is it April? I might, I might be thinking of um, Gregory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ronald Garrett, the guy that lived in the basement with Thomas Hugley. You find him four days later. You interview him, correct? Yes. You ask him about his whereabouts that night, don't you? Yes. And you get information that he's at his niece's house, correct? He went to a niece's house, an aunt's house, and then later, I think it's his child's mother's house. Yeah. You learn that he spends the night at Gloria Lee's and Fowler Building on Byers, apartment 611. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And that's a high rise, correct? Yes. It's an older folks home, correct? Yes. And I believe it's in Highland Square, if I'm not mistaken. It is. Okay. He tells you that's where he was that night, right? Yes. Do you, during the course of your investigation, go and speak to Gloria Lee, the person whose house he stayed at? I did not. Um, it's my recollection that, uh, because there's officers that work there, that, you know, sometimes detectives, we don't do everything. We do okay. delegate some things. But that, um, and what I really wanted to capture were video images or something like that for him coming in and out. Sure. Um, and so I could not necessarily solidify to my liking um, where he spent his night. Okay. So the question is, did you ever speak to Gloria Lee? I did not. Do you know if anybody spoke to Gloria Lee? I can't recall off the top of my head if they spoke to her or not, but it was not sufficient to my well, liking. You, the address appears in your report of investigation, correct? It does. So you record in your report of investigation, that address is where he say he stayed that night, correct? Yes. You don't talk to Gloria Lee. You don't know if anyone else did, but you are the lead detective in this case, correct? I am the lead detective, but I don't do their action takens. You but, haven't reviewed their action takens? No, I'm saying I, I said I don't write their action takens. I understand, but you as the lead detective would know whether someone went over in your investigation to interview Gloria Lee. I can say most certainly that I absolutely would have sent someone to verify his whereabouts. That I can say with certainty, but at this date in my report, if I didn't write down what they said, I don't want to try to recall off the top of my head. Where is that report? My report? No, that report verifying his whereabouts. Where could, is that report? This is, I'm going to say it one more, one more time. There is absolutely no way that no one was ever dispatched or sent to investigate that. However, at this late date, I am not, um, because I am not, um, even now, uh, prepared to say that I was satisfied with whatever, whatever findings if it wasn't, especially with it being his sister or his family member, um, without any type of video evidence of him coming in and out, it would not have been sufficient for me. If Gloria Lee said he was there? Yes. All right. Where is the action taken or where in your report of investigation does it say the video at that apartment complex was viewed by somebody to determine whether he was there or not? It's not written in my report. Was it ever done? At this late date, I can't say. Absolutely someone did go and check that out. But at this late date, I can't tell you what their findings were. But whatever they were, if, they, if I didn't write in my report, I solidified this, then it wasn't there to my liking. Well, ma'am, you, you didn't put that in your report, did you? 
No, that's not my report. No. And as the lead detective, you certainly have the authority to talk to other officers that are involved in your investigation and said, hey, we need to go do this. Go do it and report back to me. Yes. You didn't do that in this case. It's not It's not written there, but absolutely I did send someone to go and check that out. But if I didn't write it in there, again, I will reiterate and I'll concede to this. In my opinion, when someone is someone's sister or family member, direct family member, sometimes they can be a biased witness. So if I didn't have in my, if whoever went out to go and check, and I do have a person in mind, but I won't say because I didn't write it, um, that if they don't have video, a capture of him, then I'm not going to trust that and exclude them as a suspect. He was still a suspect. Judge, if there is a report or an action taken, we have not been provided it, and I would ask that it's clarified before we proceed. If it's not in the evidence, then it's not, it's not, it's not one. And if it's not in my um, written report, then I'm just telling you what the course of my investigation, what I would do, and if it's not written in there, what was not sufficient for me. As you said, I'm at witness stand right now, Detective. Yes. I want to know, do you have any evidence whatsoever that this interview took actually took place and that, are, and that there is a report reflecting what the result of that interview was? I do not have a written report reflecting what those findings were. Do you have any evidence in any report anywhere that you could point to as we sit here today, five and a half years later, indicating whether anybody from the Akron Police Department or any other police agency went over to that apartment complex, pulled the video, and, and looked to see whether Ronald Garrett entered that building and most importantly, entered that building in apartment 611 as he had indicated? It is not. After you interviewed Ronald Garrett, you drew, based on your training and experience as a detective, some observations about what you felt that how that interview went, correct? Correct. Just like you said, Mr. Ford was nervous. Remember saying that yesterday? Yes. On page seven of your report, you said you believed Ronald Garrett was holding back information and you told him so. You remember that? Yes. On page eight, you said, you sensed he was holding back names, correct? Holding back some information. If it says names, yes, I'll say that. Okay. Well, I don't. Yes. I, all right. If you want to look, man, please do. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. It's not and a I huge. could be paraphrasing a little too, and I don't want to do that. I want to know if these are true things that you put in your report. Okay? Uh, yes. All right. On page 11, you said you were suspicious of him because of his answers, correct? Yes. On page 10, you said he had given contradictory statements were made to you by him, correct? Some, yes. On page 50, you concluded Ronald Garrett was being very elusive and vague and had a lack of forthrightness, correct? That was some of the things I said, and also in that I didn't know if it was because he was afraid to answer or if he just didn't want to cooperate with the police or if he had more knowledge. I didn't know. Right, because you're not a mind reader. I'm not a mind reader. Those were your observations based on your experience of almost 25 years at that point in the Akron Police Department and your experience as a detective in, in, in the Akron Police Department, correct? Correct. After April 18th, you never spoke to Thomas Hughley again. Is that fair? That's fair. After April 22nd, you never spoke to Ronald Garrett again. Is that fair? That's also fair. After May 3rd, you never spoke to Gregory Lewis again. Is that fair? Yes. And I'm looking at now, as I ask questions, page 22 of your report if you want to reference it. Um, Donald McLemore. Page 22. Page 22, yes. Towards oh. the bottom. All righty. 
you um, interviewed John Old McLemore on April 27th of 2016, is that right? Yes, at um, 8.40 in the morning. Pardon me? At 8.40 a.m. Yes. You never listed the drug dealers that had the disputes with Hughley and Garrett as, as suspects, correct? Right. Okay. The first suspect you list in your report is John Old McLemore, correct? Correct. And you list him as suspect one. Is that fair? Yes. Bless you. So, John Old McLemore, you learn in your report, I think you said yesterday, had some issues with Lindell Lewis about some money he believed Lindell Lewis stole off his SSI card while he was in jail, correct? Yes. Um, and I think we heard from Mr. Hughley in this case already, the jury did, that he believed he stole around $3,000 from him, correct? Yeah. Yes. And McLemore was pretty hot about that, correct? He was upset. You also knew that McLemore... Um, had lived at Lindell Lewis's house on South Street before, correct? Which street? South Street, S O U T H. I don't know about that street. Um, South? Yes. Yes. South Street, Trigonia Drive, and maybe up on Faults as well. Okay. So, oops. I'm going to have to use another marker now because that's another. <laughs> Go ahead, take it uh, out. We'll take a little weight. That's all right. We'll change it up. The color will be better. Uh, so he lived at an address owned in the past by Lindell Lewis on South Street, correct? S-O-U-T-H. Yes. All right. And you learned that house burned up too, correct? Yes. All right. We heard from Thomas Hughley in this case. He testified in this case previously. And he said Macklemore admitted that he not only burned Lindell Lewis's van at 719 volts, but he also tried to start the house on fire about a year or two prior to this fire. You knew that too, right? No, I don't recall um, him burning the house, but yes, the car. Oh, okay. It was alleged that he burned the van. All right. Well, Hughley told us and told the jury, more, most importantly, that... The, the aluminum siding placed on that house was placed on that side house after Macklemore not only let the van on fire, but tried to set the house on fire. The house you, is news. Yeah. Pardon? The house is news New, to me. News to you. Okay. Mm. All right. But you knew Macklemore had set, committed an arson over that money in his dispute with Lindell Lewis a year or two prior to this fire, correct? The van, yes. Okay. That, all right. You're not disputing that he tried to set the house on fire. You just didn't know about that. Is that fair? That is absolute news to me, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. And I don't want you to get into what Macklemore said, mm -hmm. but you discussed some of these issues with him when you interviewed him, correct? Correct. You got a potential alibi from Macklemore when you interviewed him on April 27th that he was living at the Haven of Rest, correct? He had guesstimated that he was, not for the night of the fire, but that he had guesstimated that that might be one place he was, and if he wasn't there, he really couldn't say where he was. Okay. Did you ever check with the Haven of Rest 
to see whether he was there during the early morning hours of April 18, 2016. Again, that was delegated, and I believe it was Sergeant Lickey and someone else. So you delegated that to Sergeant Lickey and someone else to go do that, correct? Yes. What did they report back to you as the lead investigator? He was not there that night. Where is that report, ma'am? If it's not in here, I do a, um, I do recount to my sergeant and also to the major about those initial things that we do, like case logs. Explain that to me. Um, as I said, these are summaries of everything that we do. It's not necessarily um, every verbatim thing that we do um, in that. So some of the things that we just do case logs that are amongst detectives and also to report to the so, commander. So this is recorded somewhere? It is. I have it on a case log. You have it on a case log. Where is that case log? That's one of the things I have here. All right. So you have that here? Just my personal case All log. All right. Well, if you would take the time to, to find that, that answer for us when that happened. Because I, the reason I asked the question is I don't see anywhere in your report of investigation that happened. Everything I did is not in there. Well, the important things are supposed to be in there, aren't they? Yes, but right. everything everything is important. Okay. Um, it's all important, but everything's not going to make it there. All right. Well, take the time to look through that and let me know when you find it. Mm-hmm. On the 14th. Um, of what? I'm sorry, Your Honor. April 14th, 2016, um, Sergeant Lick and Detective Looney went to the Haven arrest. Um, told management about Ronald uh, Garrett and John Old McLemore. Uh, the manager said that McLemore last stayed at the Haven arrest on April 11th and uh, last ate a meal there on April 13th. So he was not How there. How could they go there on April 14th to, to check that alibi when the fire didn't even happen until April 18th? No. April 19th they went and they said that he was last there. He last slept there on April 11th um, and last ate there. Yes. And last ate there on the 14th, so he wasn't at the Haven that day. It was in the box. Have Ken. It was in the binder. Don't answer. Don't answer. I'm sorry. So you're asked. Have Ken be. Can I go there, Yes. Yeah. Hey, Ken. Judge, I'm ready. Okay, go ahead. All right. Detective Lewis, while we were making copies, my co-counsel went and actually saw these case notes that you, you had provided them to the prosecution. All right. I didn't see them. Yes, they were, they were in that box. I, I, I'm, and I, and I'm, I'm verifying that for you. I'm, I'm trying to be fair. Thank you. So, um, All right, so wait, so I want the record clear. You, the defense had a copy of those as, as well. As the state judge. Okay, we, All Neither right. of us realized it when I was asking that All right, thank that, you. That's fine. So, I'm just going to say, Your Honor, my representation was if he didn't have it, then I couldn't have had it because everything you were okay. right. Fair All enough. Right. Fair enough. Are there any other midnight major crime case logs that you have in your possession <laughs> right now? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. Okay. Other than your ROI, is there anything else in writing that you have that you are relying on to testify in this case or that you recorded in the, during the course of your investigation? 
Did I have? Yes. Yes. What do you have? What I have are two other sheets of paper, just in case what you guys have. Can, can I see them? Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, this would be the alarm information. I'm sorry. This one is. I can tell you on this day. Press the mic button, Mr. D'Angelo, for me, thank you. I'm sorry. That's good. This page. The little button on the side. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. We have that all cleared up, Mr. Gorman? Yes, Judge. Okay. For the record, there were two sheets of paper. One looked like it had handwritten notes on it from the detective, and I don't know what the other one was. The, the other one was part of the records, I believe, the prosecutor would agree, Judge, from alarm.com that had already been testified to. Okay. Thank you. Does that sound accurate? Um, I didn't look at the alarm records. Oh, go ahead. No, I, oh. I, I trust you. I, I believe that's what they are. That is what they are. Okay. All right. All right. All right. And all of that information you have other than her handwritten notes, which are her notes that she does while she's doing her investigation. That would be correct. Okay. Excellent. You may proceed. Thank you, Judge. So, um, At any other point in time, do you interview John Old McLemore? Do you interview John Old McLemore in regard to this case? No. Okay. I see in your Midnight Major Crimes case log that you, as the lead investigator, instructed Sergeant Litke to pull the video from Circle K, correct? Yes. Okay. And that's done, or that request is done, uh, on April 18, 2016, correct? The 19th. Uh, do, isn't, isn't the, re, I'm looking at your notes, isn't Sergeant Lickey requesting the video from the area gas station oh. on the 18th? He did request it. I picked it up on the 19th. I'm sorry. Yes. So he went over there on the tw at 2300 hours on the April 18th and said, we want the video from, from you, Circle K, because we're trying to find out whether or not the vehicles in the neighborhood came over this way that we saw on the videotapes, correct? Not just the video. Uh, I mean, not just the, the vehicles, but anything that might be pertinent because there could have been someone that walked up, drove up. Um, at the time, we didn't know uh, what was used to commit the fire. So maybe someone was getting, you know, some gasoline and put it into something. So anything that might render some type of evidence. Okay, fair enough. But you made that request on the on the day of the fire uh, and, and, and through Sergeant Litke, that video was prepared for you and you picked it up, if I'm reading your notes correctly, on the, on the 19th, correct? Yes. Because you thought, you don't know, but as a detective, you thought there may be some value to what we see on that video from Circle K, as you just described to the lady and gentleman of the jury, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you then review that video? Yes, I'll say I reviewed it and also um, Sergeant Lickey would have reviewed that. Okay. Yes. Um, I do know that based on this, that I too reviewed it, but you know, like with most videos, not only one person sure. that reviews. Well, you reviewed it, correct? Yes. All right. So I'm going to place on the screen here what's been previously marked for purposes of identification as States Exhibit 90. Yeah, you can pull that around if you don't mind. I can help you if you need me to. <laughs> I, I didn't know you could reach it. All right. I'm not that short. All right. <laughs> States Exhibit 90 that's already been introduced. Do I need this to have this facing them song? No, they no. all have their own. Yep. Oh, amen. Yep. So 
So looking at what's been previously marked and identified by other witnesses, the state's Exhibit 90. Do you, do you recognize that that snapshot is being taken from the video that you had, had gotten from Circle K? Yes. Okay. You see that truck in that video? Yes. All right. And you see that individual in that video? Yes. Have you, can you tell, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, who the owner of that truck is? I can't tell you who the owner is. Can you tell, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the gentleman that's depicted next to that truck, that, that's been testified to is coming out of that truck, can you tell us what his name is? I don't know his name. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked for purposes of identification of State's Exhibit 23. I'm going to ask you to take a look at State's Exhibit 23. And you see the larger gentleman who appears to be lighter, a lighter top and darker pants? Yes. That same truck is depicted in that, as, as was depicted in State's Exhibit 90, correct? Yes. Okay. Can you tell, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, who that man who exited that truck is? His by name? I don't know. Is what? You, are you saying by name? I don't know his name. You don't know who he is? No. Okay. So not knowing either of their names or the owner of that truck, I'm, I'm venturing a guess that those individuals were never interviewed as it relates to their activity in the neighborhood near Fultz and Hillcrest on April 18th, 2016. Is that fair? That's fair. You, as you sit here today, would not be able to tell us anything about those people. The only thing I can tell you about those people is their physical description does not match the suspect running from my scene. Okay. I can tell you that. Okay. Can you tell us anything else? That what was later discovered about who they were? Or who the, where the vehicle may have belonged to? Do you, do you know who those people are? Not by name. And you've never interviewed them? I've never interviewed them. You never talked to them about what they were doing in the neighborhood during the around the time of the fires. Did not. I want to talk to you about Francine Lewis. Okay. I believe you interviewed Francine Lewis on April 26, 2016. Does that sound right? You can verify with your report, please. I spoke with her a couple of times, once at the station and once at uh, her boyfriend's residence. Okay. And, and, and take your time in, in finding him, but I guess the first question is, the first time you talked to her would have been April 26, 2016? You want me to verify that or I'll just go yes, see? Yes, no, please verify. I had a brief word with her on the scene, not an interview. Um, okay. So you spoke briefly with Francine Lewis in, in the after dawn on April 18, 2016, when she arrived on scene. Is that fair? Yeah, it was a brief. Okay. But it wasn't an interview? No. Okay. The first time you really talked to her for, with any meaningful consideration towards the investigation in this case would have been April 20 what would it have been the 26th I'm going to say the 26th but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't referring back to all right something. yeah please take your time yeah it's, it's looking like it was the 26th when she and her son came down to the station and would you agree with me that in your report of investigation, you listed her as suspect number two? 
Yes. Yes. During the course of your investigation, you learned that Francine Lewis was at one point married to Lendell Lewis, correct? Yes. But I think you testified yesterday they were divorced, correct? Yes, at the time of his death. You learned during the course of your investigation that Francine had an insurance policy still in effect on Lindell Lewis, correct? Correct. You actually secured that insurance policy, correct? Yes. And then you also secured other insurance policies that Lindell Lewis had that he, had himself that he had taken out, correct? Yeah, one comes to mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. You learned during the course of the investigation that Lindell Lewis did not know about the, the insurance policy that Francine Lewis still had on him, correct? What I can say is uh, his brother did not know if he knew. He didn't tell him about that. Well, you looked at other of Lindell Lewis's insurance policies that he had taken out, and he had indicated on those policies that he was unaware of any other insurance policies, correct? Yes. So that's why I say that, correct? Amen. That was interesting to you, correct? It was. Because we have an ex-wife with an insurance policy on the ex-husband, and he don't know about it, right? Right. That is what first intrigued you to Francine Lewis, correct? I wouldn't say first, but that was one of the things. Okay. You learned during the course of your investigation that Francine Lewis and Gloria Hart pretty much hated each other, did you not? It was reported that Gloria didn't care for Francine. Um, and I wouldn't say hate, strong well, word, but well, they, they, they had some discord. Okay. That was intriguing to you as well, correct? Uh, that, that, that's the ex-wife, so um, that wasn't so alarming. Well, it was alarming enough to make her suspect number two in your report of investigation, was it not? Not about their relationship. No? No. Okay, what made her suspect number two in your report of investigation? To me, she had an, a, an insurance policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. The combination of those things, you put those things in your report, correct? I did report them, but one was more, uh, you know, could have been potential motive. So, of course, I had to investigate her. You learned during the course of your investigation that Francine Lewis had a long-standing boyfriend, boyfriend by the name of William Pryor, did you not? Yes. You talked to William Pryor at some point, do you not? Yes. You also not only get a copy of the insurance policy, but you ask Francine Lewis to provide you a copy of the divorce decree, correct? Correct. And at some point, you have to go pick that up, am I right? Yes. And I believe you went to pick that up Make sure I have it right. At 885 Springdale. Yes. All right. Is that the home of William Pryor? Yes. Okay. You pick that up and you have conversations with both William Pryor and Francine Lewis, correct? Correct. And does, am I right in saying, and check your records, please, does that happen on May 23rd of 2016? Yes, at 11.38 p.m. Okay. May 23rd, 2016. During the course of that interview, you conclude in your report that William Pryor lies to you about the cause of a death of a Mr. Emmett Stewart, correct? Um, Based on the um, discussion at sidebar, 
the state's uh, objection is overruled. Um, subject to Mr. Gorman, clear, you clarifying that with uh, the witness. Yes, ma'am. Detective, what I was asking you about was your your conversation with Mr. Pryor, and I'm not asking you to tell us what Mr. Pryor said, but as as the detective in this case, when you interviewed him, you that, that topic of the death of Emmett Stewart came up, correct? Correct. And, and you knew that Mr. Pryor was not telling you the truth about how Mr. Stewart passed. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And you recorded that in your report of investigation? Yes. Now, I'm not here suggesting that Mr. Pryor was responsible for Mr. Stewart's passing, correct? Right. All right. Um, and you would agree with that? Yes. Okay. You just knew he wasn't telling the truth about it? Yes. All right. Okay. You may proceed. Thank you. So at some point, you get the description of William Pryor, correct? Yes. All right. And you also had a chance to see William Pryor too, correct? Yes. Okay. And you conclude... Now, to clarify, Mr. Pryor is Miss Lewis's suspect number two's long-term boyfriend, correct? Correct. You conclude that he looks an awful lot physically like Mr. Ford, correct? Per their uh, driver's license um, information, yes. Okay. I think you put in your report, and feel free to look at it, that... In viewing the video of the person at 719 Fultz who is squirting the lighter fluid or whatever that substance is onto the house and setting that house on fire, that Mr. Pryor appears to you, as the detective in this case, to be of a similar age to that person. I think they're 12 years apart, but a similar build and weight. No, I'm not asking you what his age is in comparison to Mr. Ford. Uh, you concluded that the person, Mr. Pryor, and his physical traits appear to be similar to the physical traits of the person that is seen in that video as far as age, we can't physical have... build, facial hair, and complexion. Correct? In the video, you cannot see age, but if you were, um, I think what you're referring to is that the person who was running was not running like a young spry gentleman. Um, so yes, well, here's in that what I, way, yes. Here's what I ask you to do. I'd ask you to look at your report of investigation. Which page? Um, I'll find it for you. 36, 37. Mr. Riley says 3637. I'm going to trust 36, you. 3637? Yes. Paragraphs. Well, it's not that big. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Scott? Oh, that's not right. I'm sorry. Right, because that, that gives right. his, um, per right. BMD, that gives his, Mr. Pryor's age, All right. height, and weight. All right. We'll, 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 we'll get to it. We'll, we'll find it. How about page 54? Uh, middle paragraph, it starts with however. Want me to read a whole paragraph? Sure. However, I learned that uh, Williams's age, physical build, complexion, and facial hair was consistent with that of the suspect seen in the surveillance video and almost identical to prime suspect Stanley Ford. Yes. So you, you made those conclusions in your report of investigation, correct? Correct. Okay.
Do you ever ask either Francine Lewis or William Pryor to provide you with an alibi as to where they were on April 18, 2016, in the early morning hours when that fire occurred? I believe she offered it up, but what I did instead was pull phone and cell, cell tower records. Oh, okay, but we're not always where our cell, and cell, phone, our cell phones are, are we? If you're on it. Yeah, well, maybe someone else is on it? Could be. Right? Mm -hmm. So our cell phone tower doesn't tell us doesn't tell us necessarily where an individual is, correct? According to your logic, it, it may not. Well, if you were a smart criminal and you knew about mm -hmm. cell phone towers and you knew they could be tracked, you could, in fact, have somebody else use your phone at a certain time while you were somewhere else, correct? You, you could. So when a detective like you pulls the cell phone towers, it doesn't match where the person may be, correct? I won't say that. Well, how, why won't you say that? Because you're saying two things. So if, if someone were to orchestrate an elaborate crime and have someone use their cell phone, yes, that's possible. But when I pull cell phone records, I'm not immediately going to surmise that the person is doing that. Can, can I see the notes that you wrote on the cell phone top, the, the cell phone calls from Francine Lewis? No, I just have a, um, I referred to them in the, from the data process and it's, it's in that, it's in a whole stack of printouts. Well, the one, you, you recorded some phone calls on a piece of paper. Oh, amen, made, yeah. amen. Can I take a quick look? Yes. You have Francine Lewis listed as a suspect in this case for a reason, don't you? I did. All right. Did you ever ask her where her whereabouts were, where she was, and what she was doing during the fire on April 18th of 2016? She offered it up. Where is that in your report, ma'am? It may be alluded to when I when I spoke with her on like that. Um, on the same during the wee hours of the morning. I, I, I'm not saying it's not in your report. I want you to take a look at your report and let us know if you Stand recorded by. where she said she was. Maybe you did and maybe you didn't. Stand by. Not, I'm not reading her whole statement, but right here where she just voluntarily offered up um, that she had nothing to do with the death and that they got along and that, um, yeah, but, but off the top of my head, I don't so, remember. So ma'am, I want to stop you for a second. I'm sorry. I, I'm not asking you what she said. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm asking you if you can relocate anywhere other than her denial being involved, can you locate anywhere in that report where she tells you where she was while the fire was happening? Not written, but she did tell me where she was when she called when she learned. And, and as it, where she was when she learned of the fire? Yes. All right. She learned of the fire hours after the fire, did she not? I think it was, I think that four o'clock call. When she was getting ready for work. Did she not tell you that? No, when she got the four o'clock call. Well, I, want you to refresh, I want you to refresh your memory, okay? I don't want to get it wrong. I want to get it right. Right. I don't want you to guess. It's not fair to you. Right. I want you to look at your report and tell us the information I'm asking you to tell us. Right. Okay. You want me to read her whole statement? I want yep. you to refresh your memory with her statement okay. and tell us whether you can tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where she said she was that night. Okay. While I'm searching, I will tell you. Well, I don't... I don't want you to do that. Okay, I'm sorry. I want you to answer Mr. Gorman's question. Okay. If you can. Yeah, because we had some long interviews. Yeah, 
I don't see it written in my report. I just have my own recollection. Okay. So the answer then would be, in your 60-page report of investigation, it does not indicate that you asked Ms. Lewis, Ms. Francine Lewis, where she was during the fire, nor did she offer that information. That's not contained in your report. Is that fair? It's not contained in here as every word that got said was not, but it was offered up. Okay. But an alibi for someone you considered a suspect, wouldn't that be something important that would re end up in your report of investigation? It ended up in the conclusion. It, it ended up that you asked her where she was in the conclusion? No, that she was eliminated as a suspect. You eliminated her as a suspect? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. How about Mr. William Pryor? Did you ever ask him where he was during the fire in question in the early morning hours of April 18, 2016? I would have to listen to that whole his whole conversation again, but um, no, it was it was my understanding from our conversation with them that they were both at home. Does that appear anywhere in your report of investigation? That may not be written explicitly in here. Did you do anything then to verify that they were in fact at home if in fact they told you that? Outside of the cell phone records, I could not verify that. All right, let's talk about the video that was retrieved during the course of this investigation for 2016 at 719 Fultz, the fire there, okay? Yes. You became aware that Chester Williams at 714 Fultz had video surveillance cameras on his house, correct? Correct. That clearly became of interest to you, fair enough? Yes. Okay. You sent somebody from the crime scene unit to that house to collect video, correct? Correct. Because you wanted to be able to view it to help in the investigation. Fair? Fair. Okay. Do you recall the name of the person you sent? I didn't send anyone in particular, just crime scene. Okay. Um, to my recollection, I know Detective Hall was one. Um, and, and I'll tell you, she's testified in this case. Mm -hmm. Simona, is that correct? Yes, Detective yes. Simona Hall. Um, that she was there, collected video, okay? Yes. You're aware that the video she collected was, was approximately one hour worth of video just prior to through after the, video, after the fire, correct? Correct. She did not collect the DVR, the hard drive, so to speak, at Chester Williams' house in April of 2016, correct? Correct. You are aware, though, that a DVR was collected in this case, fair, from 719 volts. Yes. Right? So the DVR, at least, it, 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 although damaged, was able to be retrieved from the debris at 719 volts, and video was being able to be developed from 719 volts through that DVR, correct? Yes. You're aware that that DVR, although there might be an overwrite and every 30 days it might t tape over, would provide a bigger window of time other than just the hour of the fire, correct? Correct. So to contrast the two, from 719 volts we have a DVR and because we have a DVR we have a longer period of time pre-fire that we could go back and look to see whether or not maybe there was any nefarious activity in the neighborhood, correct? Yes. But from 714 volts Chester Williams, we just have a snapshot of time of one hour right around the time of the fire, correct? Correct. If we would have taken the DVR then, we could have that same bigger window of time to look both pre and post fire to see if there were any unusual activity in the neighborhood, correct? Correct. That wasn't done in this case, correct? It Perfect. was not. All right. You were also aware of another house in the neighborhood at 730 Fultz that had cameras outside, correct? 
Yes, it had a camera. Okay, a camera. I'm going to show you, if I can get this to stand up right. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked for purposes of identification as States Exhibit 12. Detective, I'm going to ask you to take a look at States Exhibit 12, familiarize yourself with it, and if you can, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what it is you're looking at. I am looking at the intersection of Hillcrest and Falls, which includes victim uh, location, the arson, homicide location, the um, Mr. Williams' address where video. There's a pointer right there. Like, you know, uh, Amen. Okay, so right now you're circling the, the address that's listed as 17, 714 Fultz. That would be Chester Williams' house, correct? Correct. And that's where we got the one hour of video snippet that we just talked about for the time of the fire, correct? Yes. All right. All right, so you, you've identified Chester Williams' home. Where the uh, arson homicide victims were. Okay, it was at 719 Fultz, it's labeled, correct? 719 Fultz. And that's where you would have gotten the damaged DVR from that we could see the wider range of activity for a longer period of time that we discussed, correct? Correct. Okay. And then, um, are you? do you remember where 730 Fultz was? 730 Fultz, I believe it's right here uh, to the west or the rear of 1370 Hillcrest. Okay. And 730 Fultz has a camera on the outside, correct? Correct. And when you approach 730 Fultz, that camera, the, the, the cord was, was, was not it's plugged connected. in, mm -hmm. correct? Did you, during the course of your investigation, ever retrieve the DVR from 730 Fultz? No. Okay. So if that cord was pulled prior to the fire and we had the DVR, we may know when it was deactivated if we had the DVR, correct? There's a lot of ifs and probabilities, but if an individual citizen reports to us that it is not working, uh, it has not been recorded, we respect, I'm going to respect that. Ma'am, you are in a aggravated murder investigation in which two people have perished. Mm -hmm. Do you know the individual personally that lives at 730 Fultz? I do not. You cannot account for their veracity, their ability to tell the truth when you interview them at that point in time in any way, can you? I also do not just assume that American citizen or any other type of citizen would just blatantly lie. Um, when there are other, for every citizen that we spoke to was forthcoming and forthright. So if a citizen tells me it's not connected, then I'm gonna honor what they're saying unless I have more to believe that they're not truthful. Where in your report of investigation does it discuss your conversation with the occupant of 730 Fultz? <laughs> Again, everything that I, every word that got said or spoken with, um, spoken to by everyone is not in here. This is a summary. Well, ma'am, don't you agree with me that that would be a pertinent, important piece of information? What do you mean? What that person told you about when and how that video camera was deactivated, don't you find that to be an important piece of information in this investigation? And it was, it was recorded in the course of the investigation that that wasn't recorded. There's also other locations that had a video um, camera that they said it was not recording, but it's not. If they're saying it's not recorded, then it's not, it's not recording. I do take them at their word. Is it in your report that that conversation took place? I don't 
don't think it's in my report. I believe it's in the action taken of uh, CSU. That it was not recording or when it stopped recording? That it was not recording. And it, it, it may, I, I would have to look at theirs or whatever um, CSU re, um, reported in theirs, why they didn't collect it. That's. Well, ma'am, you were the lead detective, though. Mm -hmm. And when crime scene unit comes to a scene in their crime scene unit truck, you direct them as to what you want them to do, correct? Evidence we want to collect, yes. You did not tell crime scene unit to retrieve the DVR, did you? No, I would not tell them to retrieve. I would not tell them to retrieve a DVR of something that a private citizen has said to us was not working or recording or connected. The video that you did retrieve from um, the scene from 719 volts, 714 volts, at some point you try and improve the quality of that video, is that fair? I did request, I believe, from the FBI if they could. Yes, you sent the video to the FBI, I believe in Quantico, Virginia, if I'm not mistaken, correct? It was wherever Jack Vickery sent it. Okay, but you had it done, you supervised the fact and asked that it be done, correct? I asked if it could, yes. Okay, and you did that, I believe, in May of 2017, correct? Uh, was it July or May? Well, let, let, me, let me help you out. It's not in there. Exhibit A. I'm going to ask you to take a look at it, and if you can, please tell ladies and gentlemen of the jury what it is you're looking at. What I'm looking at is a receipt for property, received, return, released, or seized. Uh, received from on date May 31st, 2017 at 9 o'clock. Okay. Am I right in saying that's the video that you sent off at that date on May 31st to the FBI? Yes. Okay. So on May 31st, after the second house fire occurred, you had those videos that were in your possession from the 2016 fire sent to the FBI to see if they could be enhanced. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for purposes of identification as defendant's exhibit B. I'm going to ask you to take a look at that, and if you can, ma'am, please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what it is you're looking at. Uh, this is also a receipt for property um, dated July 25th, 2017, um, and there were printed stills from the disc that was processed, um, a DVR, a processed stills, and yeah. Okay. Was that, correct me if I'm wrong, was that you receiving back from the FBI the results of that investigation for the, that you asked them to conduct, or the, the enhancement you asked them to do? Yes. Okay. So you send it off on May 31st, 2017. You get it back on July 25th of 2017? Yes. And 
long story short, I suppose, the FBI is unable to enhance those videos um, in a way that, that is helpful to you. Is that fair? They were, yes, they were unable to do any um, significant enhancement. Okay. Or any, mm -hmm. All right, that, that's a fair statement, right? Right. Okay. All right. For purposes of reflection, refreshing your recollection and hopefully moving along, I'm going to ask you, if you want to, just let us know you are, to refer uh, to page 47 of your report investigation. Okay. And I'm going to do the same. On page 47 of your investigation, this is after you reviewing the video um, from Chester Williams' home, that snippet of our, you recall? Okay. You conclude on the first attempt in that report of investigation that the suspect may have come from an alleyway or from East Avenue. Do you recall that? Do you see that? Yes, at that time it wasn't clear. Okay. I'm just asking what's in your report of investigation. That's That was in your report, right? At that time, yes. I understand. I want to know if that's in your report of investigation. Yes. Okay. Can you, with that that light pen or that, that, that laser, I'm sorry, can you show us the alley um, or the alleyway that you're referring to when you say it appears that the person is coming from there? Walking or turning around because there's a few things on here. Pardon, ma'am? There's a few things that are referenced in here. Are you talking about uh, uh, well, when the person was seen walking here? Ma ma here's, or, here's what I want you to do, okay? Uh -huh. I want you to show the jury with that laser pen where the alley that you're speaking of is located on that map known as State's Exhibit, I should be clear, I apologize. 12. 12. 12. 12. Thank you, Judge. It would be right back here. All right, so, Judge tried to save me a trip and I think I didn't make it anyway. <laughs> um, point again, if you don't mind. Just looking at it, this is also an overview, right? This is an overview. Right. right. Yeah. So it's my understanding from this overview that it would be right okay. back here. So there's an alleyway that allows somebody from East Avenue, if they want to, to walk through this alleyway and come out here. But there is a house back there, and some folks use that as a cut through. Okay. It's a cut through. It's a known cut through. Yes. Okay. And when you speak of an alleyway, this is the known cut through you're talking about, correct? Yes. So somebody could be on East Avenue. They could use the cut through and they could end up on Hillcrest, correct? Right. And they would end up on Hillcrest somewhere behind 1370 Hillcrest, correct? 1374. Thir I'm sorry, 1374 Hillcrest, yes. correct? Okay. Um, okay. Now, you watch the video and, and, and you know as you sit here the significance of the pickup truck in question that we just saw at Circle K where I was asking you to identify those folks, correct? You said I know the significance of it? Well, you, you know it's significant in the case because you know that truck that we saw at Circle K was in the neighborhood during the time of the, the commission of, of this offense, correct? I didn't know what its significant was. Well, all right. So you saw the pickup truck, that was, what appears to be the pickup truck, at Circle K. You saw that same truck on videotape in the neighborhood around the time of the fires. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. And we, it was described yesterday as having this, this um, what do you call it, white line? White stripe. White stripe. 
it, it, it was described yesterday by the videographer from, from Columbus as being a white stripe on the bottom of the truck as an identification mark, correct? Okay. Okay. So you see that truck in and out of the neighborhood at various times before the fire, uh, the, the first attempt, and even after the first attempt, correct? It was before the fire, while the suspect's running across um, the street and different times throughout different attempts. Right, exactly. And then we know by the timing of it and where it exits up to East Avenue, it goes down to Circle K, correct? Correct. And that happens a couple times, correct? Correct. And one time it actually happens where that truck is driving by Circle K and we get one picture of it, correct? Okay. You don't disagree, right? I don't. Okay. So that truck is in the neighborhood, right? Amongst others, yes. Amongst others, okay. I want to refer to your report on page 47. Okay. You conclude in your report, during the first two attempts, the pickup truck appears to be involved. Do you not? I did. Okay. I was, I was not certain it's, it's involvement at that time. All right. But you say it appears to be involved in your, in your report, correct? Okay. Y yes or no? Yes. Okay. You can't just take me for my word. You've got to tell me the answers. Yes. Okay. You see it in, your, in that video driving westbound from East Avenue and turning onto Fultz, correct? You conclude that. Same driving northbound from East Avenue turning right onto Fultz. Yes. That's what you say, right? Yes. All right. And here's what I want you to clarify for us. You say the truck turns around at 730 Fultz while the suspect is approaching 719 Fultz. Do you remember that? Oh, you know what you're talking about? Um, you're talking about another vehicle that would... Just... Man, I, but want this you, is I want you to listen to my question okay. and answer my question. You say in your report that that truck turns around at 730 volts while the suspect approaches 719 volts. Do you okay. not? That was an Hold on. Overruled, you may answer. Just answer the question. Don't editorialize. It was not my understanding that was the same vehicle passing. I'll need a moment here. Because I said... Let's stop. I'm sorry. You put in your report, ma'am, on the first two fire attempts, a pickup truck is seen driving northbound from East Avenue and turning right onto Fold Street. Do you not? A pickup truck. Yeah. Just answer my question, please. Yes, a pickup truck. The truck never comes past 730 volts, correct? Yes. Ma'am, so you say that you are able to see the vehicle that pulls into 730 volts and identify it as a pickup truck as you sit here today? Objection, Judge. Can we approach? You may. All right, the objection sustained. Mr. Gorman, you may proceed. Detective Stewart, I, I realize that you want to explain your answers, but at, on cross-examination, I need you to listen to the question and answer the question. If Mr. D'Angelo wants to get up on redirect for you to explain, he will have that opportunity. All right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm going to recap a little bit. You agree with me that the video that you reviewed would show a truck with a white stripe on the bottom of it several times driving in and out of that neighborhood, correct? Yes. You would agree with me that that same truck appears to, at some point in that video, drive up Fultz towards East Avenue and turn around at Hillcrest, correct? You, you mean driving east, Dri driving westbound? Driving towards East Avenue on Fultz. Right here. And, and turns around in the street at, at Hillcrest at one point. You, right here. Yes. Yes. Okay. There's video evidence of what appears to be the same truck that's seen at Circle K driving up Fultz Avenue at one point in that video during the 
during the, the series of attempts on the fire and turning around at Hillcrest and going back down Fultz. Turning down Hillcrest and coming back here. Uh, uh, no. There is video evidence of a truck coming down Fultz after I believe the second attempt on the fire. Okay. In making a turn on Hillcrest and coming back down Fultz. Yes. Okay. Do you believe that truck, ma'am, to be the same truck that we see at the Circle K video? At Circle K, yes. Okay. I believe that truck made that movement on that video after the second fire, correct? After the second fire attempt? Yes. Okay. What we also see during the fire attempts on two occasions is some vehicle coming down from East Avenue and stopping at around 730 Fultz, correct? Some vehicle. Some vehicle. It's unclear what vehicle does that because the camera just doesn't pick it up. It's not driving right by the camera. It's off in the distance with its headlights facing us, correct? Correct. So we don't know what make, model, a vehicle that is, do we? No. Okay. We don't know whether it's the truck that turns and makes that U-turn or that back, or, or that makes that turn and hope it comes back down Fultz, do we? Can I answer that? Sure. Yes or no? Only yes or no? The question is, do you know whether it's the same truck as the one you saw make the three-point turn at Hillcrest? From the one I looked, they were different colors. One was lighter than the other. Wait, ma'am. But I do not know. Are you saying that the white spray truck that we see in the neighborhood several times in the videos that have already been played for the jury is different than the truck that makes the turn here? If you're asking me my opinion from my view in it, yes. my opinion from my view in it, the vehicle that stopped up a little higher was a little lighter than, okay. the, than the dark one that was here. So you're saying as the detective in this case that there may be two trucks that are visible on the video. There were several vehicles that were in that vehicle. But we're talking about two trucks right now. You're yes. saying that that truck that makes the turn stops on Fultz uses Hillcrest to help make the turn and goes back down Fultz may not be the same big truck that we see with the white stripe. May not. Could be someone, could be another person. Could be someone else. Okay. You would agree with me though that the vehicle during the two attempts, that the vehicle in question comes down the street when 719 Fultz is, is, is being attempted to be set on fire, stops at seven, approximately 730 volts, correct? Somewhere up there in the all top right. part. All right, well, you put in your report 730 volts. It's part of that, won't you? Objection, Judge. That was the same issue you just said. Okay, well, so for clarification, it, I think your report said it stopped near 730 volts. It, it says never comes past 730 volts. Okay. So right, that's the current right? has. Okay, right. right. And that's a curious to you because you believe the person in that vehicle may have a working knowledge, a knowledge that there's a camera at 730 volts, correct? Yeah, that was a that was a thought of mine. Okay. And you put that in your report. I did. All right. You would agree with me that that vehicle that doesn't come past 730 volts, you cannot identify whether it's a car or a truck, can you? Not with certainty, no. What would tell you the make, model, color, type of vehicle it is? What did you see in the video that would allow you to know that? If you're asking me what I saw and why I deemed it a pickup, is yeah. that what you're asking me? Uh huh. Um, just based on when other vehicles came by, if it looked, if if the vehicle seemed higher than what what would have been a sedan a little longer than what would have been a sedan. But again, it was my summation at the time. Okay. There is no certainty. Okay, so if it was a pickup truck, you don't know whether it was the pickup truck with the white stripe being underneath it or the other truck that you, that you witnessed turn <laughs> using Hillcrest as the turn going down Fultz. You don't know if it was either one of those. It could have been, correct? I don't count that as a pickup truck. To me, that's a Suburban because it, it, it had a cab. 
or it had a so I don't count that as a pickup. Okay. So no, I don't know if it's the same. You don't know if the white striped vehicle that now you're saying is not a pickup truck but a suburban. You don't know whether that was the car or the vehicle that stopped before it reached 730 volts, do you? No. Nope. And you don't know the other truck that you say now is a different truck turning um, from Fultz onto Hillcrest. You don't know whether that was the vehicle either, do you? That, that stopped that before it got up to 730 Fultz. Well, I think that's one and the same. I'm talking about two. Did you just tell us that you watched and viewed two different trucks on the video? What I'm saying is this, is that the vehicle that's at the Circle K and that's driving by a few times yes. in its entirety up and down the street and seeing turning around from Hillcrest and coming back northbound on Falls. That that's is, the same vehicle. That is one vehicle. I made no determination whether it was one and the same as the other that was stopping and turning around. Okay, so yes. you believe then Wait, stopping and turning around, you mean not going past Fultz? Not going past 730 Fultz, yes. That I made no determination that they were one and the same. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I want to know, because I thought I heard you say two different things now. The white striped vehicle at Circle K, do you believe that's the one that drove up Fultz and used Hillcrest to turn around on? Yes. You believe it's the same vehicle? I do. Okay. And you don't know whether that vehicle is the vehicle then that stopped prior to reaching 730 volts? No. Okay. On page 47, you indicate that before the successful setting of the fire, which would be the third attempt, you agree? Yes. The suspect is seen walking from the left side of 1374 Hillcrest, correct? Yes. As though he had come from East Avenue and down the alley. Yes. That's what you conclude in your report, correct? That was my assumption at the time. Okay. In that same alley that you put in this report about that third attempt, is the same alley you pointed out to us earlier? Yes. Okay. second judge you indicate on page 47 of the report ma'am that in the first two attempts on the on 719 volts to set the arson it appears to you that the mail runs back to where the and you say pickup truck was waiting correct I'm sorry page 47 Correct. Again. On page 47, you say a, a flash of light is seen. A flash of light is seen oh. both times. Just before the black male comes running from beside the house, the male runs back to where the pickup truck was waiting. You, you indicate that, correct? That was my belief at the time. Okay. Both times the truck turned left, southbound on Fultz onto East Avenue, correct? Yes. So tell us first of all, with your pointer. Where approximately you see the man who sets the fire or the individual who sets the fire, where you see that person meeting up approximately with the truck after trying to set those two fires? I did not see the meet. What I saw is after the person ran out and I can't see, that's when the vehicle, um, the taillights illuminated and turned. But I could not see them get in the vehicle. Well, I'm just going by your report. Mm -hmm. It says the mail runs back to where the pickup was waiting, right? It appeared, yes. That's what you said, yes. right? When you say pickup now, how is it you're able to tell us that that was a pickup waiting? Again, your accent, I described it as what I assumed it to be at the time. Uh, based on looking at it, maybe we can just say vehicle. Well, I, I want to say what's in your report. So uh, according to that, at the time, I described it as that. Why did you describe it as a pickup? Because looking at it, that's just what it looked like to me. You looked at that video and concluded that that 
vehicle in waiting was a pickup? That was my best guesstimation at the time. I want you to turn to page 49 of your report, please. Page 49, I'm sorry. Okay. The italicized portion. You with me? Yes. yes. You conclude in your report of investigation, it was established that a light-colored pickup truck was transporting the suspect, do you not? That was my belief at the time, yes. Reference page 52 of your report. Okay. You conclude on the second paragraph on the first and second attempts of the fire. The suspect and the accomplice vehicle were on Fult Street, coming from East Avenue west to east. After the attempts, the suspect ran to the vehicle and immediately drove away. That is what it appeared to me, yes. On the third attempt, you said, the accomplice vehicle waited in a completely different location than the other two attempts, correct? Where are we at? Uh, fourth paragraph. On the same page? Same page, fourth paragraph. The fourth paragraph that I have is... Um, one would have to be very familiar the with the neighborhood. The paragraph above that. Third paragraph? Well, there's there's a half of a paragraph to start the page, so I called it the fourth paragraph. But but where it starts the accomplice. Yes. All right. The accomplice vehicle waited in a completely different location than the first two attempts is what you've told us, right? Yes, it appeared to have been driven right. down the, yes. This, this time the vehicle appeared to have driven down a defunct alley next to 1407 East Avenue. That's what you put, right? That's what I thought, yes. W point with the pointer where that defunct alley is. The, pretty much the one and the same that we were talking about where oh, okay. there's a um, house back here and then a cut through, a walk through, but that where the, there's a house back there. You use the word accomplice um, in your report. What's an accomplice? Accomplice is someone who may have aided or abetted in the commission of a crime. 
So when you talk about the driver of the vehicle in this matter, that would be an accomplice. I would just, yes. One second, Judge, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes, like in the last thing that you just pointed out, um, in that sentence I described the one that stopped and turned around as light colored. That's what it appeared to me. Okay. Um, and the other suburban type vehicle was darker with the okay. stripe. So to clarify then, based on your investigation, you believe that the truck, the white stripe truck, is a different truck than the truck that turns on Hillcrest and goes back down Fultz? Say it one more time. Sure. Based on your investigation and your review of the video and the differences you say between those two vehicles, the Suburban and the pickup, you believe that there are two trucks in place sort of question that we know of. The white striped vehicle that we see in the neighborhood and we also see at Circle K and the other truck that turns, uses Hillcrest as a turning point to go back down Fultz. You believe those are two separate vehicles. <laughs> The one at Circle K and the one that turned around here? Okay. You agree with me that the white striped truck at Circle K can also be seen in the video throughout the night driving in and out of the neighborhood, do you not? Yes. All right. You believe that truck to be different than the truck that we also see on video turning using Hillcrest to turn back and go down to Fultz? Up here? No. no. This vehicle, the one that turned around down here, yes. I consider that to be one and the same as, as Circle K. Well, then why did you tell us earlier that it was different color? Josh? You misunderstood. Ask I'm sorry. That's all right. Sustained. Ask an answer. Ask another question. For quick, if you want to clarify that. No further questions. Mr. D'Angelo, how many is it you? Um, Less than five? five. Yeah, okay, five, five. all right. Detective Stewart, any of those uh, suspects that Mr. Gorman has listed here on the board, I know you can't see all of them, but he has Thomas Hubley, Ronald Gary, Craig Rittenhouse, John McElroy, Francine Lewis, and William Pryor. That's who he wrote. Okay. Okay. Any of these suspects, during the course of your investigation, did you ever learn that they had access to 1374 Hillcrest? None of them did. Did you ever learn during the course of your investigation that they had access to the alarm codes at 1374 Hillcrest? They did not. Uh, what about access to 1370 Hillcrest? No. In your um, cross-examination, um, I'm going to go back well, just a little bit here. Um, On direct examination, I believe you testified that Mr. Garrett had clothing inside a 719 Fultz. Is that fair? He had items in there? Yes. And you also uh, described his demeanor when you interviewed him. Can you just re remind the jury what he was like when you were interviewing Mr. Garrett? I can ask him to answer. It's redirect. You may answer. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Um, at times uh, upset um, and other times seemed to be um, with, you know, withholding um, or maybe a bit evasive. Okay. 
Did you know, um, uh, you also testified on cross-examination about Mr. Hughley and Mr. Garrett potentially having drug dealers, you recall that line of question? Yes. Did you ever learn evidence or obtain information during the course of your, infor during the course of your investigation that Mr. Hughley or Mr. Garrett's drug dealers had access to 1370 or 1374 Hillcrest? No. Or knowledge of their alarm codes? No. Mr. Um, or Detective Stewart, uh, Mr. Gorman asked you about Mr. McLemore. Do you recall that line of questioning? Yes. Can you tell the jury, um, based on your investigation, what you knew about their relationship on April 18th of 2016? They were amicable, um, to my understanding, at that time. Okay. Mr. Gorman asked you about uh, Francine Lewis and, and William Pryor. Do you recall that line of questioning there? Yes. Line of, okay. And um, did you learn during the course of your investigation what the nature of the relationship was between Francine Lewis and Lindell on April 18th of 2016? Francine and Lindell uh, had a close relationship as it pertains to their co-parenting. When you spoke with Ms. Lewis, uh, without telling us what she said, um, would, would she describe to you the relationship between Lindell Lewis and the defendant in this case, Stanley Ford? Yes. And was that amicable? The total opposite. Now, um, Mr. Gorman asked you a lot about your assumptions that you made um, in your report about movements of trucks, people showing up in the alley, a bunch of different areas that he asked you your assumptions. Do you recall that line of questioning? In my initial um, investigation, yes. Okay, and you kept saying repeatedly on cross-examination that that was your assumption at the time. Yes. Explain that to the jury. What did you mean by that? <laughs> exactly that. Um, when I'm looking at so much video and trying to play certain things, um, I, you know, you do make assumptions as to what may be related or what, what may not be related um, until you learn more. And then you take a closer, most more concerted um, viewing of your evidence. Okay. And so in 2016, when you were writing that stuff in your report, you are basing it on the information that you had at that time, right? Yes. And did that opinion, your assumptions, did they change? Yes. Tell the jury when they changed. They changed after the second fire. Why? <laughs> A multitude of reasons. A multitude of reasons. And tell us. To number. Um, the multitude of reasons uh, first were if you have two separate fires, what is the commonality? Objection. Overruled, you may answer. There were definitely a host of suspects in the initial fire, separate from the suspects in the second fire. However, you have a commonality between the two, and that's one person. Also now the direction in which the suspect is fleeing, um, the build, uh, the, the way the person is running, what they're wearing, um, the, um, the attempts of uh, the number of attempts in both fires, um, the alleged suspect's belief about, expressed belief about both people in both sets of fires, um, the movement in between, the access to the house, um, some of those things made it much more clear. And then when, you, when I'm coming back and now reviewing um, with, the, with the closer eye, um, then I am saying that the person is going between the two houses because uh, as testimony was given before, if there's drug dealers, if it's uh, Little Mac or Mac Lamore or anyone like that, why in two separate fires 
are these two sets of people running to Mr. Ford's mother's house, getting access, cutting on the same light inside, using the same alarm codes to, to, to access and, and, and uh, two sets of, two totally sets of different family members. What's the commonality? The commonality is Mr. Ford thought that they were horrible people, that they were, you know, uh, deplorable, um, describe it as Winston Salem. I believe he did say in my um, instance that you know you have to take efforts to um, safeguard your kids, and that's what I believe I'm doing. He also offered up without even being asked, "I didn't do this," and you're feeling um, attacked when we're asking everyone the same questions. They're not believing if I call 911, uh, people are going to believe we did it. He even has the same alibi. My wife uh, was, was sleeping. Um, and I, I was sleeping and my wife woke me up. Your story is changing several times um, in that uh, I looked at, I saw flames, but I didn't affiliate with anything. Everyone in the neighborhood woke up to this loud boom, but you're sleeping peaceably. You hear nothing, nothing. That, so it's also what, what he said and what he did not say. Um, that would alert um, and in different ways uh, produce probable cause for him to have um, be now the prime suspect in that uh, in those in those fires. I don't have any other questions, Judge. Refer to page 30 of a report of investigation. Yeah, I will. Ma'am, isn't it true that you met, as you indicated to us, Francine Lewis on the morning of the fire? Yes. Isn't it true, ma'am, that the very first thing she said to you was, I had nothing to do with this death, with his death? Yes. That's the first thing she said to you, correct? One of them, yes. You didn't even ask a question, did you? Did not. The first thing out of her mouth was, I had nothing to do with this. One of the things, yes. And you note that it was not in response to anything you asked her? Yes. No further questions. All right. You may sit down. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to take a break. I know we have to, because I believe your first witness, Mr. D'Angelo, uh, Ms. Sam. Gentlemen, that's all right. Um, Ms. Sams, do you believe, how long do you believe? Um, half hour. Okay, so we're going to take a morning break, because um, we have to, uh, a juror has to make a phone call at 1230. So we're going to take our, so what I think we're going to do is go from, um, Take a 10 minute break, be back in the jury room at 20 to 12. Then we'll finish that witness. If we need to break, we will. And then we're just going to take a little later lunch today, okay? So I'm going to remind you of the admonition I've previously given you concerning your conduct in this case. It's important that you be fair. Ms. Plato, where are you going? It's important that you be fair and attentive. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. And don't let anybody else talk about it in your presence. I know you got to go. All right, please.